Hello everyone, this is Bishop Ramola from Our Lady of Victory Church. Welcome to our catechism classes. We have last Sunday began with the first lesson on our last end. And this fits very, very nicely in this current liturgical season of Lent. So I hope and pray that you all had a very good start on Ash Wednesday with this most sacred season of Lent. When I think of Lent, I want to think of readjusting our faith in us, readjusting our spiritual life. And so it is extremely important that you begin the sacred season of Lent well, that you all already have your solution, resolutions in, in place, and so that you do not waste time, because as it is every single year, Lent moves extremely fast. There are only 40 days, and so you want to have a very good start. Lent is the solemn season of the church, which leads us to the commemoration of our redemption by our Lord Jesus Christ, his passion, his death, and also, of course, his resurrection. And it's meant to increase truly our spiritual life, to take the salvation of our souls very, very serious. Of course, we can only do so by the true faith. And so therefore, these lessons, the catechism lessons for adults are extremely important to consider everything what the Catholic Church teaches about her own Catholic faith, particularly when we think what's going on in the world, but also what is known as the Conciliar Church or the Vatican. So before we begin this second lesson taken from this book, My Catholic Faith, an excellent book to deepen your knowledge about the Catholic faith, I would invite you that we begin as usual with a prayer to the Holy Ghost for enlightenment. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who hast instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant that by the same Spirit we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, Mother of Good Counsel, pray for us. Seed of Wisdom, pray for us. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today's lesson, the second lesson of this book, the Catechism, My Catholic Faith, is of the utmost importance. Already last Sunday, we, we spoke about the last end, and of course, this is very important as well. But today's lesson is very important, given the fact of modernism. And don't make a mistake, modernism, especially as expressed at the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965, 
is nothing else than bringing liberalism, the false maxims of liberalism into the church itself and changing the Catholic Church so that it is not just, I should say that it is not the only true church anymore, but that the church is changed in an essential way so that it cannot be recognized anymore as the church of Christ. This second chapter is about the Apost Apostolic Creed. And this is not by chance, because the Apostolic Creed is the exposition of the entire catechism, the entire Catholic faith, if you want, in 12 articles. And so it is important that it is in the beginning, because this is exactly what we are talking about in these lessons of the Catechism. Now, the Apostolic Creed, you recite every single day when you pray your Most Holy Rosary. It originates from the Apostles, therefore, that name, the Apostolic Creed. So, we are just reading here on page 4. Under the image, if you have it before you, if you don't, that's not a problem. Then you just listen. It says, The apostles before departed gathered together in Jerusalem in the first council of the church. There they decided to put down in a brief statement their principal doctrines, so that their teachings might be uniform wherever, wherever they preached. This statement of the Articles of Faith we call today the Apostles' Creed or the Apostolic Creed. It was formulated in order to put into fruition the command of our Lord. Go therefore and make, the, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days. So it is believed from tradition, but also from some writings of the fathers and also of some popes, that it originates from their past itself. Most probably, they formulated this creed at the time of Pentecost. Where do we find, this, that's this, the, the main question here, where do we find the chief truth taught by Jesus Christ through the Catholic Church? Well, before we answer this, with the help of this catechism, we must ask a whole, or a whole series of questions. If the Second Vatican Council would not have taken place if the crisis of the Church as we experience it would not have taken place and would not take place, if we would not be confronted by erroneous statements of Francis, we would not need to ask these additional questions. But since we live during this time of the great apostasy, we need to consider some more questions. The first question, of course, is a very important question. What is actually faith? What is this what we call faith? Or what is it when we say we believe? 
since in the judicial rite of baptism before the entire rite actually begins the priest asked the sponsor instead of the candidate who is baptized if it's a child two very important question the first question what dost thou ask the church of god so in other words why you have come to bring this child to the church to be baptized what's the goal what you're asking of the church and the answer is as you may know faith the second question connected with it and what does faith bestow upon you and the answer of course is life everlasting now what is faith since the apostol apostolic creed begins with the word i believe the modernists have changed the concept of faith do to a false philosophy primarily of kant the kantian philosophy which denies an objective reality of things kant who says that reality is what i feel or what i think in me that is reality not what i see as an objective reality but what i think and so modernism has adopted this way of thinking a sort of denial of an objective reality which of course is false condemned by pope pius the 10th so when we see contradictory statements since the second vatican council and also in the very council several heresy but also errors and since then many many errors we have to ask few questions what is the catholic faith the catholic faith is not as um, some may want it just a religious feeling or an opinion what we think about god because otherwise the catholic faith and the catholic church would be no different than any other sect and in fact it wouldn't matter whatsoever what you believe but there's an objective reality and the objective reality is the inspired word of god let down in sacred scripture and oral tradition and as it is proposed by the authority of the catholic church now back to our previous question what is faith what is what does it mean to believe and the great teacher the greatest teacher st thomas aquinas gives us the definition it's he says faith is an act of the intellect according to which it is moved by the will to ascend what does that mean what it means is marvelously wonderfully expressed in the act of faith which you should say preferably every single day the act of faith says as following Oh my god i firmly believe that thou art one god in three divine persons 
Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I believe that thy divine Son became man and died for our sins, and that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truth which the Catholic Church teaches because thou hast revealed them who can neither deceive nor be deceived. Now the act of faith has some very important elements which of course explains the Catholic concept of faith. It says after the initial, initial um, ideas of God in three divine persons, in the incarnation and the death of Christ, in the judgment at the end of time, that I believe all these truths and all of them, which the Catholic Church teaches, so in other words, what you're saying in the act of faith is that you believe all these truths which the Catholic Church teaches that is the Catholic Church is necessary so that the Catholic Church can make you known what these doctrines, what these truths are. And why? because thou hast revealed them, let down in sacred scripture and in oral tradition. And why do we believe it expressed at the end of the act of faith? Because God has revealed these mysteries and this truth, who can neither deceive, that is to say, he cannot reveal something which is not absolute true. And why? Because falsehood, errors, is an absence, is a negative, meaning the absence of truth, which cannot be present in God whatsoever. And that's why we call God the first truth. That's why our Lord calls himself the truth. It is impossible for God not to reveal the truth. So if God reveals himself, it is necessarily true. And that's the greatness of the Catholic faith, because we know it's an infallibly true. Who can neither deceive nor be deceived because he is almighty God. Therefore, he cannot deceive nor be deceived. And therefore, the Catholic faith cannot allow any contradiction whatsoever. That is why the Catholic faith in essential parts, need always to be the same. So in other words, the Catholic faith has to be the same in the 3rd century, in the 12th century, in the 18th century, in the 20th century, and in our own century. Because of that very principle. There cannot be any contradiction. And that is why our Lord founded the Catholic Church with a divine authority and gave to his church infallibility, gave to the popes infallibility, so that it is not possible that the church would command us to believe a particular dogma and it would not be necessarily true. Absolutely impossible. Because if, if it would be possible, then the church, the Catholic church, would also be subject to error. But for, for 2,000 years, the church taught the Catholic faith 
without the contamination of error. And this brings us to another question. What is Catholic? What is the Catholic faith? And here we take the principle of St. Vincent of Laurent, who said, Quod ubique, quod semper, quod ab omnibus creditum est. That is the faith. That is the Catholic faith. What was believed everywhere. What was believed always and by everyone. And if we look into our own times, in our own age, particularly the age of Francis, we see that this principle is totally rejected. But again, when we think of the erroneous moral teaching of fiducia supplicants, the so-called same-sex blessing of these irregular couples in quotation mark, or if we look at the newest thing, That is, first of all, Francis' hatred for the Latin traditional liturgy, and secondly, a new discussion recently was opened by a theologian who is a nun uh, in the Concilio Church, who said that the door has to be opened for women for the diaconate and also for the priesthood, and that is definitely the idea and the wish of the Holy Father, as she herself said. So there is a lot of discussion currently about this, but this is also impossible. It's an infallible teaching of the Church that holy orders can only be given to a man. And so... By already these preliminary remarks, you see the entire scale of what we are talking about. The very fundament of our Catholic faith is at stake. Since the Second Vatican Council, in, in especially, or should I say, more manifestly, during the reign of Francis. There can be no contradiction in the Catholic faith. What does, what does that mean? Different mysteries can be explained in a more deeper way. But there cannot be a contradiction to that degree that there is actually denial. To that extent that, for example we would say people of the 15th century believed such and such, and we believe differently, because there is an evolution of truth, which is an absolutely falsehood, which equals a denial of absolute truth, truth in itself. And this is exactly what we see at the Second Vatican Council, that Doctrines, teachings were promulgated which contradicts the previous teaching of consuls and of the magisterium of the popes, which cannot be admitted. So, let us go back after these remarks, these very important remarks about the Catholic faith to the topic we are actually discussing, it is the Apostolic Creed. So after we have recalled the definition of the Catholic faith, but in order to make it more clear what faith is, I will read to you what the Vatican Council, or as it is commonly called, Vatican I, defines the Catholic faith under Pope Pius IX. That is Denzinger 1789. This is a very important book. Every Catholic should have that. 
These are the sources of the Catholic dogma, and it contains um, numerous statements um, about from the consuls, but also from the popes, and this is a very important book. The Vatican Council says the definition of faith. Since man is wholly dependent on God as his creator and Lord. And that is absolutely true because this is exactly what we said last Saturday at the first catechism lesson. We are absolutely dependent on God because he's our creator. And since created reason is completely subject to uncreated truth, meaning to the first truth, which is God. We are bound by faith to give full obedience of intellect and will to God who reveals. So that is faith. Perhaps I should clarify. Faith is that we bow our intellect, our mind, before a revealed truth. And how do we know? A revealed truth is actually revealed by God through the magisterium of Holy Mother, the Church. Again, we don't believe certain truths, certain mysteries, because we like them or it makes sense to us, but because we believe it on the authority of God, who is revealing himself and the Catholic Church, proposing it as such. I continue. But the Catholic Church professes that this faith, which is the beginning of human salvation, is a supernatural virtue, namely the first one, by which we, with the aid and inspiration of the grace of God, believe that the things revealed by him are true, not because the intrinsic truth of the revealed things has been perceived by the natural light of reason, but because of the authority of God himself, who reveals them, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. For faith is, as the apostle testifies, the substance of things to be hoped for and the evidence of things that appear not. So we believe on the authority of God himself. That therefore our faith is not a human faith. It's a divine faith. So let us go back to our text. Once we have established now the fact of our supernatural and infallible faith and what faith truly is, the next question could be, now, where do we find this faith? If we need to have this faith in order to save our immortal souls, we need to know where we find this faith. Where do we find this, this set of mysteries and truth? And that is the answer. We find the chief truth taught by Jesus Christ to the Catholic Church in the Apostolic Creed. Now, what is a greed? A greed is a summary or statement or statements of what one believes. The word greed in English comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. That is, I accept or hold true something on the word of another. And that's why you confess. When you say your rosary, you recite the 12 articles of the faith, you, you make a statement that you believe firmly without any doubt and firmly on the authority of God himself, revealing, proposed by the Catholic Church, those 12 articles of the Catholic faith. I, so credo, the word credo in Latin means I believe. That is, 
I accept in whole truth something on the word of another. I believe with the relation to the Apostles' Creed means that I firmly assent with my intellect to everything contained in this creed. And this is not because it makes sense or I do understand it, I comprehend it, but because of the authority of God himself revealing and the, Catholic, the authority of the Catholic Church. I believe it exactly as if I had seen those truths with my own eyes. I believe it on the authority or word of God who cannot deceive or be deceived. And this is the key of avoiding any problems regarding the faith or what is called doubts of certain mysteries. Once you know and once you're convinced that you're believing based on the authority of God himself, first truth, he himself revealing, and proposed by the Catholic Church, God, who can neither deceive nor be deceived, the Church, when the Church makes an infallible statement regarding faith or morals, the same thing, the Church is teaching by the authority of God himself, it is absolutely true, it cannot be wrong or false whatsoever. This is the key of understanding our Catholic faith. Number two, the Apostles' Creed is so called because it was composed by the Apostles and contains a summary of the principal truth they taught. And as I already said, it is um, based on the Apostles. The Apostles' Creed is repeated at baptism as a declaration of faith. In ancient times, it was required before baptism as a sign of fitness for reception into the church. Number three, the Apostles' Creed has come down to us intact, except for a few clauses added by the church later in order to counteract various heresies. These additions, however, are not new doctrines, but a clarification of what the creed already contained. Thus the words creator of heaven and earth were added to counteract the Manichaean heresy that the world was created by the principle of evil, or the word Catholic was added to distinguish the true church from churches sprung up around it. As our Lord said, and you also bear witness, because from the beginning you are with me. Now, number three, there are several other greeds. The book which I showed you before, the source of the Catholic dogma, the beginning of all of this are various greeds of the Catholic faith. More known, besides the Apostolic Creed, is the Nicene Creed, which is recited or sung um, during the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass on Sundays and other days. This was mainly drawn up at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. Then you have the Athanasian Creed, and you can look up it sometimes on the internet. It should be very often read and considered because it is the uh, confession of the Holy Trinity and the, a wonderful explanation 
of our fundamental mystery of our faith, which is the Holy Trinity. And of course, in the old liturgy of pre-1955, it is um, recited by the priest in the Divine Office uh, for Sundays, especially after the time of Pentecost and the Feast of the Holy Trinity. Next question, and of course you know the answer. Into how many articles may the Apostles', Apostles Creed be divided? The Apostles' Creed may divide it into 12 articles. All the articles are absolutely necessary to faith. If even one article is omitted or changed, faith will be destroyed. But why is that? Because of the already mentioned principles of our belief firmly based on the authority of God who is revealing himself. So it doesn't matter in that sense what it is. I believe everything God has revealed because he has revealed it. That's my motive of believing, motive of credibility. That is why I believe. So whether it's the Holy Trinity, the Holy Eucharist, uh, the Virgin, the Blessed Virgin Mary, it doesn't really matter. I believe everything he has revealed and the Catholic Church has taught. This is very important. So, but if I take out even one, and this is important, if I take out one, of the articles, or even a part of the articles. I destroy the virtue of faith. And that is why, as I said last time, St. Thomas Aquinas calls heresy the war sin next to the hatred of God and apostasy. Because I destroy the virtue of faith, because I do not believe, because I like certain articles of the faith, but because I believe based on the authority of God revealing. And so if I say, as some heretics have done, and continuously doing it, I make myself the judge of what is the faith and what is not. But I do not submit my intellect under the revealed truth of God. It is symbolical to divide the, the Apost Apostles' Creed into 12 articles because the Apostles number 12. Thus we are reminded that the Creed comes to us and was taught by the apostles of our Lord. And so here are the 12 articles which you should be very familiar with. First, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Two, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Three, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. Four, Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Five, he descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. Six, he ascended into heaven, sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Seven, from hence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Eight, I believe in the Holy Ghost. Nine, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Ten, the forgiveness of sins. Eleven, the resurrection of the body. And twelve, and life everlasting. 
Amen. The twelve articles of the Apostolic Creed contains the mystery of the Blessed Trinity, one God in three distinct divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, with the particular operations attributed to each person. The Creed contains three distinct parts. The first part treats of God the Father and creation. The second part treats of God the Son and our redemption. And the third part treats of God the Holy Ghost and our sanctification. Now, after we have considered the 12 articles, in short, we have to ask some more questions. Very important questions. We read here, what acts of religion do we make when we say the Apostol Apostles' Creed? When we say the Apostles' Creed, we make an act of faith, as I have already explained in the beginning of this lesson. So in other words, that we, again, we subject our intellect to the objective uh, revealed religion, revealed truth of God. Christian faith is a supernatural gift of God, which is the first theological virtue of faith. Again, it is not as the modernist wants you to believe, a feeling. Faith is the subjection, submission of our thinking, of our intellect under the revealed truth of God. So it really has nothing to do with what I feel about certain doctrines. And here we enter the very conflict of modern age with the teaching of the church. For example, when you, when you recall this entire discussion on the same-sex blessing promoted now by Francis, because it equals an acceptance of this um, unnatural vice, sanctioned now by this blessing, as it seems. But faith is something else. This virtue of faith you receive at the moment of your baptism and can only be destroyed by heresy, that is, that I adhere to an erroneous teaching contrary to the Catholic faith. And so if I say these acts of same sex is just fine, and God is fine with that, that is a moral erroneous teaching because it is in sacred scripture and taught by the Catholic Church. And what does that do and what does that make out of Francis and those promoters? It makes them uncatholic. Christian faith is a supernatural gift of God which enables us to believe firmly whatever God has revealed on the testimony of his word. And that is why it's so important to adhere to the Catholic uh, faith regarding the inspiration of sacred scripture, that it does not contain any error whatsoever. Because if you, as the modernists do, temper on the word of God and revelation, which is one part of the fundament of our Catholic faith, you will be necessarily falling into error regarding the Catholic faith because you deny in part one of the sources 
of our holy religion. We continue in the text. By it we believe in the truth of many things which cannot grasp with our understanding. We cannot understand let's say the mystery of the Holy Trinity. It's not against reason. It's above reason. And that's exactly what that means. The text continues, for example, we believe in God, although we cannot see him. We believe in the Trinity, although it is beyond our understanding. And now it's quoted, this very important uh, sentence, without faith it is impossible to please God, St. Paul says. This is extremely important Without the Catholic faith, integral faith, that is, we believe everything the Catholic Church teaches, it is impossible to please God. And it doesn't matter what else you do, whether you are very charitable towards neighbor, whether you give a lot of money to the poor, you're still displeasing to God because you do not, you simply do not believe what God has revealed. Ultimately, it's the greatest act of pride against God. God, who is self-sufficient in himself, acts outside of himself when he reveals himself for our sake. And we, when we don't believe, when we believe erroneous teaching and errors, we just can walk away and say we don't believe it. And therefore it is an absolutely crime, an absolute grave sin, if we would not believe even in one single article of our faith. And this is also still repeated on the Pope Pius XII in 1950, when he defined the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He firmly said, if, if you do not believe even this dogma, it shall be known to you that you have fallen away from the entire Catholic faith. And why? Because of the self-same principles. Because you do not believe based on the authority of God revealing. So therefore, it is impossible to please God without his faith. And so everyone, all our listeners, and some of the people who will view this uh, as a video, will have to ask themselves this very important question. Whether Francis has the Catholic faith, it has to be definitely said that Francis does not have the Catholic faith whatsoever. And therefore, he is not pleasing to Almighty God whatsoever. And here we simply quote the words of St. Paul, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrew 11, verse 6. Number two. Faith does not require us to believe in anything contrary to reason. Remember, faith is not contrary to reason, it's above reason. When we believe what we cannot perceive or understand, we act according to reason. Why? Because it's of a higher order and it's not against reason. In fact, it's very reasonable to believe which is revealed and which is not according to our full understanding. It is according to reason which tells us that God cannot err. As I already have explained, it's impossible for God to err or lie or deceive us. 
We therefore put our trust in God's word. And if you wouldn't do that, there would be the end, the absolute end of the Catholic faith. In many natural things, we often believe what we do not see, as sound waves and atoms, on the testimony of scientists who have studied them, or in our, in our age, many, many other uh, scientific discoveries. Thus, we act with, within reason. But how much more reasonable is it to believe on the word of God? Number three, a great reward in heaven awaits those who suffer persecutions or die for the faith or some Christian virtue. The number of martyrs who have died for the Catholic faith is estimated at more than 16 millions. So, when we consider the holy martyrs, especially at the first three centuries of the Catholic faith, this is the, the greatest motive of rejecting the erroneous teaching of the Second Vatican Council, especially when it comes to communism. Because if ecumenism is true, so in other words, if other religions also have their value, if they are true, then the real question of course, why did those holy martyrs die? Why did they shed their blood? If it doesn't matter whether you are Buddhist, Hinduist, Muslim, a Jew, if it doesn't matter, if it's not of such an importance, then they really died in vain. They could also have sprinkled incense to the Caesar who was believed to be God. It wouldn't matter. Why did they die? They did die because there is only one true religion, the religion which God revealed through his own son, Jesus Christ, the, the Catholic faith. We continue. All the apostles suffered persecution, and all except St. John suffered death by martyrdom for their faith. St. John the Baptist was beheaded because he censured Herod for violating the law of marriage. Remember, St. John the Baptist, he died because he defended the indissolubility of marriage. Of course, it's a total different topic, but he is the patron saint for the indissolubility of holy matrimonium. St. John Neposnosen was put to death because he refused to violate the seal of confession. Therefore, everyone who acknowledges man, me before man, I also will acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. For... Neglect of the studies of truth of our religion is frequently the cause of lukewarmness, a bad life, and final apostasy in impenitence. And so that's what I'm saying. And that's what I said last time. It is so crucially important that you study the Catholic faith, not the new uh, catechism of the Catholic Church, but the all pre-Vatican II. Because only if you know your faith, you can truly discern all these erroneous teachings which are floating around. We are constantly confronted, whether in society or in church. You can only discern it, what is true and what is false. If you know your Catholic faith. We continue. We should be zealous in studying the Christian doctrine in the catechism, in religious lessons, in sermons, missions, and retreats. If you have any doubt, we should consult our priests. God will not forgive ignorance if we voluntarily neglect the means he has granted to dissipate it. And so I think I made it pretty clear 
how important it is to have the Catholic faith, the true Catholic faith without any compromise. Because as the church teaches, only if you die in such a way, only if you believe in the God-given religion of God and all the mysteries he has revealed, then you can save your soul. And so this is the most important, as we have said last time, our final end. Because at the end, it doesn't matter whether you have accumulated lots of riches and you had a lot of power in this life or influence or you have enjoyed a life full of pleasure, licit or illicit. At the end, only thing matters whether you have saved your soul. And so this is why the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared in 1917 at Fatima, to remi remind mankind that there is such a thing as hell. Even though Francis now believes hell is empty, this is an old, old error, an old heresy. There is such a thing as hell. There is the possibility that I will not go to heaven if I do not live according to the will of God, if I do not believe the Catholic faith, if I do not act according to the maxims of the Catholic faith, there is the, then I will not go to heaven. And so this is my most important work, my most important obligation in this life. That's why I am alive. That's why I'm in existence, to save my immortal soul. This is only what matters. Ultimately, that is why our Lord came to this earth. That is why he suffered. We consider that during this season of Lent, especially during Holy Week, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. That's why he rose from the dead. So that I can be saved. So that I can be happy for all eternity in unity with Almighty God. With God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. In unity, in absolute unity, with God and be happy forever in this absolute blissful vision of Almighty God. God bless you. So we, um, we, we stop here with this second lesson and we'll continue then next Saturday at the same time at 1.30 p.m. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are the monks, women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now in the hour of our death. Amen. I will give you the final blessing. Sit nomen Domini Benedictum ex hoc nunc et usque in seculum. Auditorium nostrum in nomine Domini, qui fece cenem eterum. Benedictio di Omnipotentis, Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, descendat super te, vos et maniat semper. Amen. So I wish you all a very blessed first Sunday of Lent, and so try to begin the sacred season of Lent formally tomorrow on the first Sunday of Lent as an intensification of your spiritual life, of your Catholic faith. God bless you.